<clears throat> we finally concluded our study through the book of Romans. And last Wednesday, we started our study on the book of John. And it's interesting, you know, John, <clears throat> in his writing, uh, sums up the book in chapter 20. So last week we went over there, took a look at a couple verses, and saw the summarization of John in regards to the purpose of this book. And John just reveals that by saying, I, essentially, you know, I'm writing this book to influence people uh, with the gospel and to uh, give them evidence that Jesus is the Son of God. <clears throat> and uh, we, we, we compared briefly the Gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yes, they all cover uh, who Jesus was, but they all show a different side of Christ, uh, and they're all geared towards a different specific people, if you will. Matthew was geared towards the Jew. It presented Christ as king. Uh, the Messiah. Mark presented Christ as a servant geared toward those Romans. Uh, Luke, the son of man, the perfect man, uh, because he was writing more toward the Greek. And then John presents him the son of God to all man. And uh, I think that's important. And that's what John said. And so uh, that kind of gave us a springboard, I think, into the rest of the book. And so let's go to chapter 1 and let's take a look at what John has to say. Today we're going to try to wade through about the first 13 verses or so. And uh, it would be very easy for men far more intelligent than me to, I mean, just absolutely crawl through this text. It is rich. Amen rich and um, I, don't, I don't know I may slow down at some times but uh, I don't want to get super slow at the same time you know what I mean I want to try to uh, wade and, and, and you know I want to take our time but at the same time like I said some men literally crawl through this stretch of scripture because it is very rich in truth okay so let's look at the Bible together. John chapter 1 verse 1. The Bible says in the beginning was the Word. Notice that the word Word is with a capital W. Um, that's always significant. Amen. Uh, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Amen. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. So verse 3 is talking about uh, who the, the title the word was given to. So the word is a person and verse 3 references that person and says all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. That word light has a capital L. Do you notice that? Bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the light, or the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, 
but of God. That is plenty to chew on today, I do believe. Amen. So, as I said, very rich, very rich portion of scripture here. <laughs> and as we look at it, again, I want to remind you a little bit about the author of the book. John was an apostle. He was one of the first disciples, as a matter of fact, uh, that you come across in the scriptures. He was the son of Zebedee. He and his brother James, they worked in the fishing industry. Uh, and they together played a role in the inner circle of Christ. When you talk about the inner circle of Christ... You're thinking about the Mount of Transfiguration and you're thinking about the Garden of Gethsemane. How that Christ went a little further and brought with him Peter, James, and John. And so that is the John that we're discussing here. He is known as the Beloved Disciple or John the Beloved. Uh, he stresses love, being that beloved one. Throughout the book of John, you'll find that the, the topic of love is being stressed throughout the book of John. And he was also a close companion of Peter in his ministry and in his work with Christ. Uh, also remember that the Lord Jesus committed uh, his, the care of his mother Mary to this same John. Uh, the date, as far as the book is concerned, they really ain't sure about it. Uh, some want to believe it's the last book of your canon of Scripture. I tend to disagree with that. I believe the book of Revelation is the last book of the canon of Scripture in its, in its writing by John, the same John that wrote this book. Nevertheless, here he is, and he begins his writing by doing something that is different than the others. The others dealt with the uh, conception and inception of Christ, how that Jesus was born and they focused on the lineage of Christ and things of that nature. And John doesn't do that. <laughs> because John's focus is not so much that he was the son of man and we're thankful that he was the son of man. That's important. But what's far more important than him being the son of man was that he was the son of God. This was God's son. And that's how John presents him. And as the son of God, what we need to remember and realize is that uh, as God's son, uh, he is given a title here uh, by John that you don't find used by anyone else but John. I want you to notice again, John's giving us an introduction. We're being introduced to Jesus Christ. That's what John's doing. He's introducing us to him as God's son. And he does so, first of all, by introducing him, listen to me now, as the word. Pay attention. He introduces Jesus with this designation as the word. So he's introducing Jesus Christ. First introduction of Christ is as the word. This word uh, used to describe the Lord Jesus, again, can be found... <clears throat> in John's writings only. You find it twice here in the first chapter of John's writing of the gospel. And then over in 1 John, if you want to flip with me as I reference some verses, that is fine. Over in the book of 1 John, <clears throat> again, same author by inspiration of God uses this same title of Jesus, given to Jesus, if you will, as the Word. Book of 1 John, if I can find it. Uh, book of 1 John and chapter 1. He says there in verse 1, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the, capital W, word of life. Then he uses it again down in verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Rather, verse 7, or excuse me, chapter 5, verse 7. Sorry about that. Look at chapter 5, verse 7. The Bible says, <coughs> and there are three that bear record in heaven. Here we are. The Father, who's the Father? Well, that's God the Father. That's not hard to understand, is it? The Word, capital W, Word, and the Holy Ghost. 
I don't think anybody will argue today as to whether or not this is describing the Trinity. Amen? Help me if you're agreeing with me tonight. Amen. Now, if I'd have asked you before you walked in the building, can you tell me, can you declare to me who are the three persons of the Trinity, the Godhead, you would say the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. You say, so Brother Shirley, who is the Word? The Word is Jesus. Amen. Jesus has been given, He reserves the title of the capital W word. This is His title. His title uh, is derived from a Greek word that is given, that's used, uh, that is the word logos or logos. And it simply means, uh, it means a word that is spoken. Or rather a voice that, that speaks word. Amen. And so when we see this understanding again. Uh, this is not only giving us his title. But it's also describing for us uh, who he is and what he does. His role if you will uh, that Christ has within the Godhead the Trinity. And so we see his title, we see his, his time, and we see his task in this, this, this designation that is the Word. Again, his title is the Word. The time is also given in chapter 1, verse 1. It said, notice, in the beginning. You know those three words have been given already at this point. You find them in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Most of y'all can probably quote it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And that same phrase that's used here in John 1.1 1, 1 is not being used haphazardly, but it's been used specifically, church, to point us in the direction of Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. That same three words that was used in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning is what John is trying to to draw our attention to. It's a, it's a phrase that was reserved for when God started this thing in the beginning. It's also used over in the book of Hebrews and chapter 1. Excuse me, the book of Hebrews and chapter 1, the writer of Hebrews, I believe to be the apostle Paul says, there in verse 10, he said, And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the works of thy hands. This phrase in the beginning is not only uh, given there in Genesis, but John's referencing it and he's connecting Jesus Christ, that same one that, that the, the, the uh, writer Luke presented as the Son of Man, and Luke did a very good job by inspiration of God of connecting Jesus, the Son of Man, to David, uh, uh, back to Abraham, all the way to Adam because his lineage, the generations of Jesus Christ, was vitally important and he was to fulfill the blessing and the promise that was given all the way back to Eve uh, uh, there when you find the gospel that his heel would be bruised by the head of the serpent. And so Jesus fulfilled that. But John is not only pointing him to Mary and doing trying to connect Mary through there. No, that's not John's task. That's not what John's accomplishing here in the book of John. He's connecting him to the Lord God the Father. And he does so by pointing him in the direction of the beginning of this thing. And he gives him that, that title of the Word because he wants us to, to connect him. Listen to me now. He wants us to connect him to the beginning of this thing. You say, Brother Shirley, how can Jesus who was born of man, be connected to the beginning of this thing. Because even though he was the God incarnate, he is without beginning. He never became. He always was. Amen? When you go to Genesis, you find God saying, let us make man in our image. Why? Well, because there was three in one in the Trinity that is the Godhead. And Jesus was there in the beginning. We see the time, we see the title, we see the task. The task was creation. 
The task was creation. Notice what it said. It said the same was in the beginning. With God, all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. There in the book of Genesis, you'll find ten times there in chapter 1 alone, ten times where the Bible said, And God said, And God said, Let there be light. You don't find God snapping his fingers and everything coming into existence. Could God have done that? Why, sure. But that's a silly question to ask. The the question that should be asked is, how did God do it? And according to the scriptures, listen to me now, God spoke everything into existence. There in the book of Genesis, when God started creating this thing, and when God laid the foundations of the earth, and when God hung every star in the sky, and when God did everything he did there in the beginning, he did it all by the word of his mouth. Did you hear what I said? Hey, I said he did it all by the word of his mouth. Well, who's the word? Well, Jesus is the word according to John chapter 1. And therefore, we can deduct that Jesus was the very one that God, the Godhead, utilized in the creation of everything. Over there in the book of Hebrews, there in the book of Hebrews in chapter number 1, the writer speaks a little bit more on this topic and gives us a little bit more understanding uh, to help us to see how that Jesus played a role in creation as the word. Verse 1, the Bible said, God, who at sundry times in diverse places, or excuse me, diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. There it is again. How is he speaking? What, who is the mouthpiece of God? Who is the mouthpiece of the Godhead? It's Jesus Christ, his Son, capital S, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. There it is, church. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, uh, when he had it by himself, purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. I'm talking about God's son, Jesus Christ, that one that was born a virgin birth, that one that was in the manger, that one that lived 33 and a half years as a man was here far before his birth ever took place. He existed far before he ever uh, stepped foot on this earth as a man because he is God's son. He is the word of God. He predates anything that we've ever seen or, or experienced because he never became. He always was. Psalms chapter 33 and verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. And all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea together as in heat. He layeth up the depth uh, in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake and it was done. I like that right there. Amen. For he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. That's wonderful. You want to know why God can't lie? Because whatever he says is. Because his words are so strong. What he says has so much power. Why has it got so much power? Because it is Jesus. Oh, this is just wonderful. This is our God. This is giving you and me some insight as to just exactly who God is. And just exactly how strong our God is. That listen, just by what he says, what he speaks, has no choice but to be. Oh, that's wonderful. So oftentimes we we neglect to appreciate just exactly who he is. I, you know, how many times you mamas that's got babies, how many times you you tell them or or speak something that you're hoping will come to and it just ain't you, you might as well be wasting your breath, amen. You beating your face against the wall would do you probably a little bit more good than to continue to talk because our voice has very little strength. And then we get louder and think that's going to accomplish anything. And oftentimes it it accomplishes a chuckle. Amen? We're wasting our time. 
But my goodness, listen to me. Let, let, a, let a still, small voice of God be uttered. You know what we need? We need His voice. We need His Word. We need, and guess what that is? That is Him. The Bible said in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word. This is the pre-existent, or pre, excuse me, pre-existence of Christ. He did not come into being at His birth. Amen? Y'all realize that, don't you? I've had conversations with people in here that struggle with that and want to think, not in our church, but having conversations with people outside of our church, that want to think that Jesus did not exist before his birth. And that is so heretical. That is a damnable heresy. Like, if you come to believe such a foolish thing, you ain't, you ain't believing that because the Bible. Right. He's throughout the whole thing. Amen. We find Amen. him in the pages of the beginning of this book. This is the preexistence of Christ and the coexistence of Christ. You say, what do you mean? He coexisted with God the Father. God the Father didn't preexist Jesus, and, and Jesus did not preexist God the Father. No, listen to me. They are eternal and without beginning. Amen. They never came into being. They always were and they always will be. That's why God told Moses, he said, tell them I am that I am hath sent thee. Which means I always am and always will be. Amen. That's him. That's his existence. It's pre-existent. It's co-existent. We not only see that Paul here presented Christ as the word. And we see that word as the title, logos. Uh, for God said, God spoke these things into existence. We see the time in the beginning. We see the task, which was creation. Um, in this statement of creation there in verse 3, we see an affirming truth. It says, all things were made by Him. You, you don't have to question. Who made it? Why did they make it that way? Whose decision was it? Well, it was God's, and Jesus was the culprit. And then we see an absolute truth. Without him was not anything made that was made. Amen. Uh, if you don't put Jesus in the beginning of this thing, there is no beginning. There is nothing. For God chose to utilize Christ as the word to create everything. John presents him as the word. John presents him as the life. Verse 4. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Amen. <clears throat> we see the location of life. The Bible says there in verse 4, In Him was life. Say, so where is life today, Brother Caleb? Life is in Christ. Amen. And in Christ we find life which denotes that he does not stand in need of someone or something else for life. This, this, this is where you find the doctrine of aseity, uh, which is a theological term that simply means that he is not only pre-existent, he is not only co-existent, but praise be to God, he is self-existent. Amen. Uh, Jesus is self-existent today. Because in him is life. Amen. And he does not stand in need of anyone or anything else to give him life because it is him today. Jesus never went to a funeral that somebody didn't get resurrected. Why? Because he is life, friend. Amen. And death, death does not exist in him because he is life. He, he is eternally uh, with life today. Amen. Because he always was and he always will be. This is the location of life. He is self-existent. He is self-sustaining. He is self-sufficient. He is God's Son and our Savior today, friend. It matters not who you are, where are you are from, what time period you're of. You have one hope in this life. And that hope is found in the self-existent Son of God. Amen. 
Jesus Christ. This is the location of life and the manifestation of life. The Bible says, in him is life, and the life was the light of man, or men, excuse me. The Bible said, and the light shineth in darkness. We see this manifestation of life. How is life manifested? Life, church, pay attention now. Life, according to the scripture, is manifested by light. Life, we know, is everlasting in Christ. Amen? Amen. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Is that what the Bible says? Is that what the Bible says, church? Help me now. In John 10.10, 10, the Bible says this. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. The life that Jesus gives is life everlasting and it is life abundant. And life gives to them, pay attention to me, light. You say, Brother Shirley, what are you trying to say? What does light do for you? Let me ask you this. This is a little better. Farrell, if I shut off all the light in this place, there's none, what's the first thing that you're not going to be able to do because of it? So does light give you sight? Yes. You know what what scientists have found? Scientists have found if you go into the deepest, darkest caves of this planet, And you find creatures, little salamanders, little bugs, crawfish, shrimp. They'll tell you those creatures' eyeballs have been deemed useless because they have never seen light so their eyeballs don't work at all whatsoever. So it doesn't matter how good your eyeballs are or how good sight you have physically. If you are without light, you cannot see. The Bible says life gives you light. The Bible says if you don't have life, you don't have light. Anybody that looks at this Bible and walks away thinking God is evil or God is unjust or God is not good, Must not have light. Must not have life. How can people take an innocent baby inside of a womb and destroy that life? How can they not know that that is murder? They have no life. And because they have no life, they have no light. And because they have no light, they can't see. How could a boy... Convince himself that he is not a boy and try to have surgery done and sacrifice his life because of his foolish desire to be a female. No light and no life. How can these people, Brother Shirley, see what what has to be done so that they can see? They're going to have to come in contact with the light. They're going to have to get to know the life, the word. We see this manifestation. No life, no light. Can't see, blinded by darkness. Life is the cure for darkness. Life is the cure for darkness. Because with life comes the next introduction of Christ. He introduced him as the word. He introduced him as the life. He introduced him as the light. The light, verse 5. And the light shineth in darkness. Notice, and the darkness comprehended it not. This is vitally important for our comprehension of our standards for life, the walk of this life that we live. Everything that we do, listen to me, everything that we do, we need to realize what is darkness, what is light. Am I right? Am I right? 
You know, the Bible tells us in, in 2 Corinthians, I'll read you this verse because I think it resonates well. 2 Corinthians in chapter 6 and verse 14, if you want to write that in your margin, it says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Here we have two contradictions. He's writing to believers. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? There's your two distinctions. How many of you still listening to me tonight? Say amen. amen. He said a believer and an unbeliever should not be yoked together. It's unequal. The believer being righteous, the unbeliever being unrighteous. He said what communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? <clears throat> what part hath the he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them, walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. There is a difference between light and darkness today. Period. And we can convince ourselves that sin is not as bad as, it, as, as they used to say. <clears throat> and we can preach a, a, a message of license and lasciviousness. Meaning, hey, there's grace sufficient. You can do whatever you want to. His grace is good. But if that's the junk that we spew, it is darkness and it is a lie. And it is not coming from God and it's not coming from His Word. Hey! And Jesus didn't tell us to say that. Because He is life and He is light. Amen. Amen. And John here tells us that darkness cannot comprehend light. Christian rock and roll is absolutely a, an opposite and in opposition to what the Scripture says. That's free. I'm not getting bogged down, but that's just the that's the best example. It'll it, five minutes of reading, five minutes of reading what Google tells you about the essence of rock and roll, and you're going to walk away knowing that's darkness. You have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to determine what is darkness, what is light. And I should never try to mix them. And look, it's not okay to live in darkness and then at times live in light as long as I don't try to mix them. No. The principle is stay away from darkness and don't convince yourself that when someone's trying to mix darkness and light that that's still light and it's okay. Amen? Does that make sense? Jesus is light. And darkness can't even comprehend light, the Bible says. And so what we see is we see the light. We see it's uncomprehendable to darkness. And we also notice that the light is upheld by a disciple. The Bible specifically mentions John. Speaking of John the Baptist. There was a man, verse 6, sent from God whose name was John. We see this upheld by the, up, upholding by the disciple in John the Baptist. The Bible says he was sent from God. The Bible says he was specifically sent from God to bear witness uh, of Jesus Christ. In other words, he was sent by God to cause others to believe that Jesus was God's Son. And the Bible tells us of this disciple that he was not the light. Verse 8. He was not that light. God forbid anybody elevate John the Baptist to the level of Jesus Christ. Um, I'm not a Baptist today because John was a Baptist. John the Baptist did not start the churches that we uh, belong to and participate in today. As a matter of fact, John the Baptist was an Old Testament prophet. Amen. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets. And, and you know what he did? He brought a message by God to baptize those Jews that had repented for the remission of their sins. Why did he do all that? Because 
it was told that there would be a voice crying out of the wilderness. That title was reserved for him and him alone. Talking about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist came preaching the truth of God's word about God's word in the Son, Jesus Christ, that anybody that would receive him would be received by him. Not only do we see the uncomprehendable, or un, yeah, uncomprehendable to darkness, talking about the light that is Christ. This light was upheld by a disciple in John the Baptist. And lastly, and I'm done for today, we see the unveiled designation. This light gives a designation, a title to them. Who receive it. Notice verse 10. He was in the world. And the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came into his own. And his own received him not. But. As many as received him. We see the reception. We see the reception. Let me make a statement. For the Calvinist that may be. Listening in. We still must receive him in order to be saved. And the reception that takes place in the life of a believer is the moment of faith. When you believe in him, you then therefore have received him. The Bible says, as many as received him, we see the reception. Then we see the inception, which is to become The initiation. As many as received him, notice, to them gave he power to, what's the next word? Become. Look at what the Bible says with me. I hope you're still there. Verse 12. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become. Now that's something that Jesus never did. He never became. For he always was. Who was he? The Son of God. That's what John's showing us. He's the Word. He's God's Son from the beginning. When the foundation of this world was laid, there he was. And he came to this world and allowed himself to become a man child to take upon himself the flesh of man and lived his entire life and gave himself for one purpose. And that purpose was to fulfill the Old Testament requirement that would give mankind the ability to become what he was, what he is. We see the reception to receive him, the inception to become, and the conception, which is the sons of God. Verse 12, to become the sons of God, even to them, notice, that believe on his name. To receive him is to believe on his name. That's the connection of verse 12. We see here, <clears throat> the conception of the son, in, in, or rather the man that believes and receives Jesus as, as, as his Savior, has been therefore conceived, he's been born, he's been washed of his sin, and brought into the family of God, and the Bible said in verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It is God's will (coughs) that everyone that receives him will not be turned away. The Bible said that he will in no wise cast you out. There's never been a lost soul. Go to God in repentance and faith in the gospel that God said, you're just not good enough. Amen? You say, so how must one be saved? You must receive the word. 
You must receive the life. You must receive the light. And the only way you can receive Him in these capacities is by rejecting the world's word. And by rejecting what the world says is life. And by rejecting what the world says is light. You know, the world thinks they know what truth is. and They don't know what truth is. They're in darkness. They can't comprehend truth. It's amazing. The nonsense. The nonsense. And we, we, we mock, we mock. And, and, and look, it's hard not to mock a young person that wants everybody to believe they are an animal. It's hard. It's, I mean, like, that's the most foolish thing. <clears throat> Brother Beckham, when you were a high, in high school, you couldn't have fathomed that there would be a day where a human being in their right mind would try to convince others that they are a creature and try to make sounds like a creature and then to think that the United States would try and protect them and try to inhibit anybody to tell them that they need to wake up and be a human. And here we are in 2023 and that junk has taken place and you say, how? Darkness. They don't, even, they don't even comprehend light, the Bible says. The only way anybody becomes a son of God is to put their faith in the word, the life, and the light. That's who, that's who John's presenting to us. Ain't that amazing? Who Jesus is? Look, he's not just giving us these things. He is these things. Amen? Let's bow our head for prayer. Lord, thank you for this attentive crowd. It's been wonderful. Thank you for your precious word, God. I pray, Lord, that you'd use it for your honor and glory. I pray, God, you'd help me as I continue in this study uh, to have liberty, to have, Lord, unction, understanding, anointing. God, speak to the lives and hearts of these people. It is my prayer that um, we have a strong appreciation for the Bible. Or so oftentimes we've read across these scriptures very briefly, very quickly. Lord, hit the high notes, and that was that. But God, I do desire to, <laughs> I desire to draw out of these scriptures, Lord, deeper truths that, Lord, give us an awe, Lord, a wonder for who you are. And in spite of my inabilities, I pray, God that that's what would happen in this study. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all.